Tell us who would benefit from reading your book. Do you identify yourself as a late bloomer? When I ask that question to people, even people who achieve big and early oftentimes relate this idea that they're a late bloomer because they, I had a roommate in college named Bob, and Bob was Phi Beta Kappa in his junior year. He went to Stanford Law School. He became a very successful Silicon Valley lawyer. Now, in my eyes, Bob was an early bloomer. Relative to me, he was an early bloomer because I was the guy that had, at age 25, I could hold a job no re more responsible than security guard, temp typist, and um, dishwasher. In fact, I reached a low moment once, one night um, when I was 25 and I was a security guard at a trucking firm and I walked the fence perimeter and I heard a dog barking and I whipped out my flashlight and discovered that, that there was a Rottweiler next door across the chain fence. And then it occurred to me something that was deeply embarrassing that at age 25 my professional colleague was a dog. Now, <laughs> it's comical, but when you're living it out, it's not as shameful. And then it was even more shameful when a couple months later, Steve Jobs, also 25, took Apple public. So when I look at the Bobs of the world, they're, they're nothing but early achievers to me. When I talked to Bob about the book, Bob said, you, you don't understand at all. I'm a, I'm a late bloomer. What do you mean by that? And then he proceeded to tell me all these slights and all this disrespect that he felt in middle school and high school. He was kind of slow, he, slow to grow into his full size. When he did, you know, he was a varsity volleyball player in college. But in high school, he was smaller. He hadn't come into his own. He lacked confidence. All of those kinds of things. So he pictures himself as a, as a late bloomer, too. And I think that's useful because I want everybody to think that they can bloom once, twice, multiple times. And really what late blooming is all about is finding that perfect intersection of your deepest talents and your deepest passions. And that can occur multiple times because we change. Our deepest talents evolve. Our brains evolve over the course of our lifetimes. We may, you know, typically we evolve from a real narrow technical expertise about something when we're young toward more managerial and coaching skills when we're in middle age and toward these kind of mentoring and wisdom skills in our 60s and 70s and beyond. So the deepest passions, the deepest talents, but the deepest talents and passions as they change over the arc of a life. And if you can do that, you can bloom any number of times. The reason I wrote the book was I believe we created at the level of school today such an obscenely high amount of pressure on young kids, teens, and young adults to achieve very early, to achieve in measurable ways. Well, what does that mean in school? It means that we're achieving for the things we can test for. Well, what, what can we test for? Well, standardized tests, ultimately the big race to take the SAT at age 16 or 17, grades, but grades in advancement placement courses, and because we measure those, we tend to overvalue those, and we completely ignore the much deeper reservoir of skills that human beings have, all kinds of skills. And I think it's tragic that we've, we, we've cut off paths of discovery for young people when we should be opening them up. We should be, we're asking young children at age five and six to trade their natural childish curiosity for a determined focus. You know. We give kids that young homework. It's, it's insane. It's not producing the results that educators had hoped. In fact, what we're seeing is a rising, even alarming rate in depression, anxiety, and even suicides among teens and young adults today.